Good afternoon. Welcome. Rotary connects the world through celebrating our friendships, diversity and unity of purpose. Please welcome President Adriano Cistanino. Thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome everyone to our lunch meeting 4805, our 11th for my meeting. A very special welcome to our guest speaker, Paul Kennedy, who uh, Vice President and Past President Peter Neal will more formally introduce later in the meeting. Welcome, Paul. And welcome also to any visiting Rotarians and other guests joining us today for our meeting. Um, birthday greetings uh, this week. We have uh, David Mottram, whose birthday was last Monday. Um, happy birthday, David. Uh, um, I hope you had a lovely long weekend. Celebrating their anniversary this week, we have quite a few. We've got Daniel Clift, uh, three years uh, with our club. Andrew Daniels, uh, six years. Simon Berry, 10 years. Roscoe Shilton, 24. Ollie Clark, 25 and John Hendrickson and Jeff Wagner, 31. Congratulations to you all and um, on this uh, incredible achievements. As usual, all important announcements will be shared via our bulletin each week, uh, any mail, chimp emails, and also by, uh, by our Facebook page and the WhatsApp group for last minute notices. We've got two more meetings to go for this Rotary year. I just would like to remind you that in a fortnight we will have our changeover meeting. It will still be a very special meeting, even if it will be an online meeting this year. We will take you through a journey of um, the past year, announce some uh, um, new honorary members, some very well-deserving PHF recipients, and of course, induct next year's uh, President ID. I hope to see you all at the meeting. Like we've been doing in the last few weeks after today's meeting, I will be setting up some breakout rooms. Um, please remember that you will need to accept the invitation to join a room. Um, don't forget also that you can still contribute generous, generously to our community projects by placing a donation in our virtual vaults on the website. I will share a link uh, um, after I finish. Um, and lastly, a reminder that we are recording these online meetings and they will be available on our social media channels and website as a podcast in a day or so. I will now hand over to our uh, speaker source for today, uh, Vice President and Past President Peter Neal. Just, I, yeah, I need to unmute. Yeah, no, I'll, 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 I'll fix it. <laughs> uh, that's why we won't cross over there. This week's Spotlight on Service is about our wonderful monthly social meetings. The next online social evening is on Tuesday, June 16, next Tuesday, between 6 and 7 via Zoom. Join in, in our conversation with Fast District Governor John Campbell, who's the current chair of the Australian Rotary Health in South Australia. He'll be chatting about the origins and impacts of this meaningful Rotary activity. In particular, its work in supporting and fostering research on mental illness and health. So important in this COVID-19 era. Please try and make it online and look at our website for more details. I have a couple of confessions to make. I watch breakfast TV, but I don't tune in to see my cousin on seven. For many years now, I've been a fan of the ABC News Breakfast for news, weather, and an interesting slant on sport. For some 10 years, sport has been the domain of our guest today, and in my opinion, he's without peer. Paul Kennedy is a delight to listen to, informative, balanced, and always with a smile. But this is only a small part of his toolkit of talent. A former footballer and current coach, he's a published and successful author too. Each work is real, well researched and written with fact, emotion, and passion. Perhaps his best known work recently is Hell on the Way to Heaven, co-authored with Chrissy Foster, one of the triggers for the Australia's Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. But more about that later. Please welcome Paul, or PK as some know him, to share with us today his views on sport, journalism, COVID and coverage. Over to you, Paul. Who's your cousin? Koshi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no wonder you like Port Power. <laughs> uh, it's in the thank, you very 
Stop <laughs> shaking your head, Paul Denver. <laughs> Uh, well, we look forward to the showdown on the weekend anyway. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Peter. You're too kind. Um, just for, for everyone listening, um, for me to, to talk in this way to you over Zoom is, um, is good fun. And um, uh, I feel quite honoured to be asked to do it. But also, it's, it's tricky because um, if I uh, talk about a, uh, one topic and not another, and uh, I tend to go on too long, uh, I can't really read your body language and um, and know that I'm um, going into an area that uh, that might not be of interest to you. So, what I'll do is tell you about a story um, that uh, involves basically where I where I came from and how I got into journalism, and then how I came to be involved uh, in the writing of the book Hell on the Way to Heaven that Peter mentioned. Uh, and in doing so, I'll. Um, I, I might jump around a little bit, but I'll only go for about 15 minutes and then I'm more than happy to take questions. And that might even be the best way um, if you want to get something out of it or, uh, or know something about the ABC or, or whatever you want to hear about. Um, because, yeah, sometimes I, I think, why would you want to hear me um, um, babble on? But uh, what I would like to... Um, ba I'll basically give you a, um, uh, a broad view of who I am. I'm um, 44 years old now. Um, I've, so I've been in journalism for 25 years. I was, um, I, I suppose I went straight into journalism after school, although there was a, a year of uncertainty after I got expelled from high school, where I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and that, that year was spent uh, being a labourer. And um, I think I was on the dole there for a while, but I was also playing football at Fitzroy in the seconds. Uh, on a supplementary list, the distinguished supplementary list, which um, uh, wasn't a pathway to any AFL greatness, um, as I hoped it would be through uh, when I was a kid. All I wanted to do was was uh, play footy. Um, but now I'm obviously working at News Breakfast. I've been there for 12 years. I never sought a career in sports journalism. In fact, I rejected it for a long time because uh, most sports journalists have to work on weekends. And I wanted to play and coach football for as long as my body allowed me to do. So I'll, um, I'll just go through how it all started for me. Um, I live in Seaford, which is uh, one suburb before Frankston on the train line uh, from Melbourne. So about an hour south of Melbourne. Um, and I grew up here. We, uh, we, as a family, we grew up in Seaford. And I had uh, a brother and two sisters. Uh, Dad was truck driver. And uh, mum was a social worker and had, um, she went back to school as a mature age student when I was about 10 years old and, and studied to do social work. And she worked for about 25 years in foster care, uh, helping place kids at risk in, in families. Um, and dad had always had a broad, um, broad interest, but really his, uh, his main pastime was um, uh, driving us around to, to sport and uh, he coached me for a couple of years and so I couldn't have asked for a better family life. Um, so I'm, I believe I'm very lucky in that regard. I was a bit of a lout uh, in my teenage years and um, I was directionalist there for a while, but I had a wonderful group of English teachers at school. School was, um, uh, could, could be a rough and ready place at our school uh, in the outer suburbs, but um, you know, we were, we were very lucky. I particularly reckon our English department was as good as we could ever have hoped for, as good as any school could produce. And I had one teacher in particular who was a literature teacher in year 12, who introduced me quite late. Now that I look back, you know, I wish I had started reading much earlier, but um, she introduced me to the joy of reading in year 12, as I was trying to break into the AFL. So I had my football on, on uh, I was a footy head on one side of uh, my life and and then she was introducing me to these other parts of um, uh, things that excited me almost as much as footy when I started reading those great books that she introduced me to. So after high school, I tried to make it in the AFL, uh, didn't quite uh, turn out. Um, but what it did do was it got me thinking about what else I wanted to do with my life. And I went into journalism through the back door. Uh, perhaps I rang, I tried to get a cadetship at the Herald Sun and, and missed out on that. I, I, they said, they, they said my written application, when you sit down for a test, your written application 
you write a story basically on facts that they give you and then you have a current affairs test to see how worldly you are or you know test your knowledge and the feedback was my written test was one of the best um, of that year of the applicants but my current affairs knowledge was one of the worst they've ever seen um, mainly because I just read the back pages of the Herald Sun um, and the local newspapers to um, to get the the, uh, the scores and the best players from the, the morning to Peninsula Footy League. So uh, I went away and addressed that somewhat. Uh, I was able to talk the Herald Sun or Herald, Herald and Weekly Times into giving me a job as a copy kid. And so um, I was an errand boy there for 12 months at the old uh, Herald and Weekly Times building in Flinders Street. Uh, after that, I knew enough about journalism to know that I didn't just want to um, you know, read and write for a living, but I love the way that the newsroom worked and I fell in love with news, um, everything about it. I then was able to um, talk my way into getting a cadetship with leader newspapers, which has got me thinking in the last couple of weeks uh, quite deeply about uh, what I did and, uh, and the role that local journalists play in, in um, Australian life, because all of those newspapers have now ceased to be printed. They, they remain online in some form, but nowhere near what they were when I went through. I had a great cadetship and I had a terrific mentor as a senior reporter. And very early on the piece, uh, which seems, seems uh, very strange to me now, but um, that I even was able to get my head around this as a young reporter who knew nothing, um, I got a phone call from my local MP and he told me that I needed to go to a local uh, meeting. There was a family meeting. And the family meeting was, uh, or meeting of families, I should say, was at the local church, at Sacred Heart Church in Oakley. And uh, I went there, not knowing what it was about at all. And I turned up and the meeting of families was um, a very serious meeting about the local parish priest who had been convicted and jailed on uh, child sex offences. Um, the meeting that took place was all of these families trying to come to terms with that and trying to work out basically uh, which of the local children had been victims and then what would happen next. That was 1996 and uh, I wrote a, a front page lead on that story and I also wrote a breakout page uh, and a colour, what we call a colour story, uh, which was about a woman who had um, commanded the attention of the meeting by reading out a letter of her feelings. And uh, I didn't name that woman at that stage, uh, but that was Chrissy Foster. Uh, and many years later, after I covered that, I covered a big meeting they had with the, uh, the Archbishop, the new Archbishop George Pell had convened a meeting and I covered that for the local news and uh, moved away and, and covered a million other stories, I guess. Um, and eventually went to Channel 10. Uh, and then uh, I was in cha uh, Channel 9. I, I worked briefly at Channel 9 for a year, 2007, I think it was. And um, that was uh, when I found the news that uh, Chrissy Foster's eldest daughter, Emma, had died. And I went to the Channel News, uh, the Channel 9 news director, Michael Venus, and asked whether or not I could cover Emma's funeral and do a story on her life. And um, uh, Michael Venus, to his credit, uh, there was another a big funeral on that day in Melbourne. And I didn't think he would, uh, he would allow two funerals in the first break of, of the news, but he did. He said it was an important story, I agreed, and we covered Emma Foster's funeral. And Anthony Foster, Emma's dad, gave one of the, um, the best speeches, uh, most powerful speeches I've ever heard. And from that, I, um, became uh, at, at first an acquaintance, I guess, of the, the Fosters. Um, I suggested after talking to Chrissy that she should write a book. And then um, a couple of things happened along the way and uh, a publisher told Chrissy that she thinks that she should write a book, but she needs a journalist to help her with that. So um, Chrissy asked me whether I would help her write the book and together we wrote Hell on the Way to Heaven, which, um, I mean, I could talk about other stories I've covered, but that, I think that's the, the most important piece of journalism that I've ever done. Well, I know it is. And I suspect it might be the most important work that I will ever do because um, being able to help Chrissy with her voice and tell her story in the way that we did, which turned out to be 
a piece of investigative journalism as much as uh, Chrissy and Anthony's family story. Um, I think that changed a lot of things. I certainly think it instigated the parliamentary inquiry here in Melbourne into um, uh, Catholic church cover-ups and sex abuse. And then of course there was a, a spate of other fantastic work and um, survivors were speaking out uh, in other parts of Australia, including Newcastle and New South Wales. And Joe McCarthy was doing great work there for the Herald. Um, there were strong voices out of Ballarat and then Julie Gillard eventually stepped up and announced the Royal Commission into, um, into institutional abuse of children and, uh, and cover up. So um, yes, the, um, that was held. And of course that's many years ago now, and we're still trying to come to terms with the, the recommendations and how well or well, uh, how well they've been followed through or haven't. And uh, that includes uh, things like the, um, like the redress scheme. So, um, that was really the, the first book I wrote. I wrote I've written three other books. Uh, as I said, none of them as important, I don't think, um, but uh, have each been um, good pieces of journalism, I think. Uh, and in the future, I hope to write more books. Uh, however, in all of that time, um, going from Channel, 9, Channel 10 to Channel 9, and then landing at the ABC, uh, I've got busier and busier on the home front because uh, I've got three sons now. And uh, looking back, uh, when I started News Breakfast, I had one baby and Kim was pregnant with our second son. And now I looked around and dropped them off school this morning and about the oldest one's 14, second one's 12 and the youngest one's seven. So um, I'm finding that life gets busier and busier. Um, and it's exactly how we want it. But <laughs> I, I will say that the, the break in the, uh, the break in the play, as it were, with uh, everything stopping has been awful for many people. I, I believe that we've been quite lucky. The ABC has been terrific in letting me work from home and present the sport from our, our spare room. And um, yeah, I, I've got a lot of friends who say that they've seen way more of their kids than they ever did. Because I've worked on the show, and this was deliberate, because I worked on News Breakfast, I've been seeing so much of my, my kids anyway. Um, and this has just been an extra extra bonus, more time with the kids and at home and all the rest of it. So I don't know what the future holds, but um, yeah, I, I have quite enjoyed the um, bringing the news from home and putting the pictures on the wall, which people seem to like. And, uh, and I've been able to finally make the most of uh, uh, the big bookshelf that I've got of all those sports books, they're coming in handy. People are liking the tips of the uh, sports books on the desk. So um, sometimes my wife says, why do you keep all those books? Well, now that's the reason because we've got a pandemic and I need to, uh, I need to put the books on the desk. Um, are there any questions, Peter? I, I'd like to throw it open to, to questions now. Otherwise I, I feel like I'm, I'm rambling, but no, no, you're not. You're not rambling, Paul, uh, but happy to, I think it'd be great to have a bit of uh, interaction. Yeah. And just remind everybody in the room that if they'd like to ask a question, they can do it either by putting a, a note on the chat page or raising your hand and waving like fury or just yelling out. I can perhaps start the, uh, the comment about, you mentioned COVID and the current situation mm. and, and you're reporting regularly about uh, sporting, uh, sport opening up, as it were, and we've yeah. got this this weekend. We've got a very important match here in Adelaide, uh, uh, which you mentioned before before we started the meeting. What other observations have you got regarding sport and COVID uh, from your perspective, Paul? Well, I've, I've always viewed sports, um, and to just give you a broad brush on, on my involvement in sport, I, I'm obviously a, um, football is my main love. I, I played a lot of footy. I played everything growing up. Um, footy and cricket were the main sports for me. And then football took over. And I played until I was a captain coach. After I left State League, I played for Frankston in the VFL and I played a bit in Queensland when I was at Channel 10 there um, in, the, in the Quaffle. I came back and I took over as coach of my local club at Seaford in the Mornings Peninsula League. I fell in love with coaching. So that was when I was 27 years old. 
I was a playing coach and our, our local club looked like it might be in a bit of um, strife at that stage with people leaving and uh, you know, all sorts of uh, things that happened to local clubs. Um, so I, for five years, I was a playing coach. And as you know, anyone knows involved in, uh, in community sport, if you hold a position of, of um, uh, importance on the committee or you're the coach or, or, or a decision maker, then um, you, you either run a million miles and never do it again or you fall in love with it and just want to do it forever. And so that was me. I loved coaching. Uh, eventually, I became a little bit too battered to keep playing, but I've since become a junior coach. I love junior coaching. I would probably coach another club if I had more time, but my role now is I coach a, a school team in the, uh, in the private school uh, system in Melbourne, uh, and I coach my kids, and I'm, I'm going to get involved with my, the local secondary college. Our kids go to public school, and um, I, I wouldn't mind um, coaching there as well. But I coach an under-14 team. Um, so that's, that's where my perspective is from. I've, I've been involved in running clubs. I think that the, the COVID-19 uh, break, uh, if, if possible, can be something that resets community sport a little bit particularly with football and, um, and other sports that, um, that tend to pay money for players and um, uh, always sort of wrestling with, uh, with different issues like that from financial viability. I think at the top level as well, um, but also at community level, I think it's time to reset and ask, ask ourselves what, what is really important thing here. Um, and I think if we play, place more emphasis on participation and family, creating family environments and doing all those things to make, make them um, more attractive places to be and place less emphasis on money, even premierships. I think it can be a time that we can sort of reset and, um, and make sport even better. Um, I also think that with junior sport, we really need, I've always been a big, fan of um, placing a great emphasis on participation, particularly through those ages of 12 through to 16, where a lot of kids drop out of sport. And I believe that we put too much emphasis on those pathways to the top leagues. And we're, we're really putting, um, uh, even, in, even in the language and the way that we set up these uh, representative teams these days, um, there's so much pressure put on the kids that um, firstly, you, you put a lot of pressure on the kids who are, who are good at sport and maybe suck a little bit of the fun out of it for them, but you also um, disenfranchise the kids who just want to play with their friends and, and don't see themselves being a Brownlow medalist or, a, uh, or an Alan Border medalist or a Belinda Clark medalist. Um, so I think uh, if we can reset things, concentrate on participation and just making sport an enjoyable place to be, we might be able to uh, pull back on all of these pathways that have really become, you know, seemingly important, which, you know, I think it might be detrimental the way we've, we've pushed those things. So I hope that makes sense, but that's the way I'm looking at it. Um, if we can make it a more, if we can concentrate more on the fun and the benefit of health and exercise, then uh, we might be able to ride that ship. Makes excellent sense as usual. Uh, Peter Bartels, are you there? Oh, Peter had his hand up. He's just gone for a Tosca. Uh, in the meantime, we might... Adriano, the president's got a question. Yes. Um, my great, I mean, touching on what you just mentioned, the fact that obviously you're enjoying very much coaching um, uh, um, young people, and yep. the, the approach you've taken and, and some of the frustration, I suppose, you're experiencing the way um, that direction is going. Having, had, um, having gone through a lot of um, 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 this with my own kids, I think I would have thought that the relationship with the parents would be one of the toughest things in that, um, in that environment of coaching young people uh, to manage from a coaching perspective. Um, do you get to share your views on that and how do you, yeah. manage, how do you manage that within your, your group and the, the kids that you're teaching? Yeah, I think um, the main thing is when I, when I coach, I went the other way around. Some people start coaching juniors and they progress to seniors. I started coaching seniors and then went to juniors when the kids were old enough. And um, people were telling me that, um, uh, you know, juniors is harder than seniors. 
because you have to deal with all the parents. I can see where they say that, but I, I, I don't see it that way. I think, uh, in fact, there's not that much difference. When you're coaching, you have to be really open with, with people and just tell them um, what your aims are for the season. And you have to explain to them um, what your priorities are. And I think that probably clears a lot of it up. Uh, and if you need to have a discussion with a parent about uh, what they expect from from your coaching um, or their kids' participation, then you can get that out of the way really early and, and speak to them before the season just by explaining to them. And, and I've had discussions with people about um, uh, giving kids equal time, for instance. That's just one one thing. It's it's, it's not a small thing. It's it's a it's a big thing. But um, uh, some people get hung up on, you know, my kid's the best, they need to play in this position, they need to do this. I think um, I'm pretty good at explaining to them that if you turn up to train uh, and you, whether you're lucky enough to be born um, coordinated or whether you're physically developed early or whatever, whatever the situation is with your ability or your development, if you turn up to train, then you are due equal time on the field or on the court. And so that's the big one for me is that um, prioritising, you know, who gets a go and who doesn't get a go. In my view, if you go out of your way to turn up and train and put the time in, then you deserve to be given um, equal time on the field or on the court. Um, and you, usually people see the sense in that. Um, sometimes parents get a little bit blinkered by what I was talking about before, this this pathway system, and they, and they think that they're their child's development is being stalled by not being um, given the spotlight or, or whatever they want. Um, that's a big mistake for parents to make because if you've got a coach telling you and teaching your child about respect, about fairness, um, about uh, you know work ethic and all those things, then you've got a really good coach. Uh, and, and they will, if, the, if they want to make it to the top and and they want to win all the trophies, they'll do that. Um, but not if they forget all of those um, things that are really based around teamwork. So, um, yeah, it can be tricky if you've got a, uh, got a parent that doesn't know where you're coming from. But I find if, if you express yourself and, uh, and clearly communicate what you're trying to achieve and just be completely open about it, then, uh, then everything will be okay with the parents. With the school team I've, I've got, um, we did, uh, what did we, we lost a game or some sort of controversy happened. And then the school, because I'm not connected to the school, but I coach. And then someone explained to me that the parent group will be okay, um, that they'll understand. And I didn't know there was a parent group. I had never heard that term before. Um, but, uh, you know, I just, if, if the parents want to have a chat, I'm always open to it. But, um, but, yeah, never really had anyone have a big go at me. I guess if they were unhappy, there's always other teams they could go to. <laughs> Paul, just to follow on for that, uh, you, would I be right in saying you're not, not a great fan and everybody wins a prize? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a tricky one because when I talk about participation and equal game time, uh, I have been a accused of, um, of being someone that's, uh, you know, an every, everyone wins a prize type of thing. And the, the whole argument is always comes back there's always someone that says we need to have our uh, sons and daughters um, go go through losses and um, we need to teach them about life um, the thing is and it, there's an argument there about how young kids need to be when they, you keep score when you have official score um, and votes for the best and fairest I think the main thing is kids know the score all the time so you don't have to go out of your way to teach kids um, life lessons. I mean, I, I prefer to teach them those those basics about um, teamwork and respect. And and the kids the kids will have the losses. They, they don't have to um, go looking for for losses. They always know the score anyway. Um, so I'm all about kids. If they if they put in, then they'll get the rewards. Um, yeah, the prizes are neither here nor there for me. Um, but, but I, I do think that you need to reward effort. And if that effort is coming from the, the, the kid who's, who's, um, 
out and out best player, well, yeah, you've got to reward that excellence and that effort and determination, that that uh, that grit. It's so good to see a kid that's uh, that just wants to get the ball all the time. Um, but having said that, if there's a if there's a boy or girl that's in that team that can only get a you know one or two touches a game, but they're trying just as hard, when I then I'm uh, I'm tempted to give that that child equal recognition at that age. And then as they go through, uh, you know, the, the stars will emerge. Um, but yeah, if they get good experience, my dad always taught me that. My, my dad was, uh, was probably the best junior coach I had. Um, he was, a, he came from Sydney, he was a rugby league man, really. He played rugby league and rugby union, was in the Navy and Army and played those rugby codes. So he didn't know all that much about Australian rules. But he was he's the fairest man I've ever met and um, and so I got that experience from him when I was a kid and I applied that in my senior coaching no don't worry about juniors I applied those methods in senior coaching and, and saw that the rewards were there so uh, I don't know if that answers your question Peter. Um, that's, that's I, I don't think I don't think all the kids need a prize but I do think that they if they if they uh, give it their best they do all need that recognition and, and positive feedback and then that fuel, hopefully that fuels a love for sport. Yeah. And, that, and that's the encouragement they need. Uh, Peter Bartels, you're back online. You had a question, I think. Yes, I did. Um, Paul, just curious about what you think the, um, um, the codes could do for supporting the Aboriginal community. I mean, if we look, there's been a lot of very, very successful sporting players across all the codes. And with what's happened with COVID-19 and now the emphasis on, on Black Lives Matter. Just wondering what you think more the codes could do. I mean, I've umpired football for over 30 years and I just yeah. saw some horrific things in the way in which Aboriginal players were treated and probably still are. We just don't see it. It's more subver subversive now. Mm. Just wonder what you think that the, that the codes could do to provide more support, particularly around this issue around the deaths, because it's just an uh, abhorrent number when you look at look at it in real lives and we, the real terms and we say, hey, we're nothing like America. Will the numbers say otherwise? Yeah. Um, I'm no expert on this, but I, I see that there are a lot of outstanding Indigenous um, athletes and, and coaches these days. And I think we should, um, as, a, as a sporting public, really respect what they have to say and, and, um, and listen to them a bit more. I think... Um, you know, the way Adam Goods was treated was absolutely appalling. And I thought, well, here's, here's a guy, what, what more can Adam Goods do? He's just a great champion of the game, uh, a role model. Um, and I thought we missed an opportunity there to, to listen to what, what Adam had to say. Uh, the booing, I thought, was, was disgraceful. And I'm still not sure, even though they produced those two documentaries, was it last year or or even the year before, might have been last year, they both came out around the same time. Uh, you know, I still had conversations with people in the AFL who were shaking their heads and still wondering whether or not, uh, you know, the booing was, was uh, you know, uh, driven by racism. So I do worry about that. I think we, we should promote our Indigenous role models better. I'd, I'd still think it would be good if we had more Indigenous coaches particularly in Aussie rules, um, given, uh, given that there are so many outstanding past players who would make great coaches. Um, interestingly, there's a, uh, a young man called Tony Armstrong who's just joined the ABC. And uh, he's a former player, but he's a, he's a budding journalist and um, he's done a little bit on TV recently. But um, we're looking forward to seeing more of him. He's going to be on Breakfast News tomorrow, in fact. He's only just joined the ABC as a presenter. Um, and I look forward to, to Tony sort of answering these questions in, you know, better than I can. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, if, if we promote and listen to our elders, uh, for, for want of a better word, then, um, then that might be a good start. But as an, as an umpire, I'm sure you've, you've seen... Um, more of it than I have uh, on the fields. Uh, I think the AFL and the NRL has done has done well to a point to um, to make sure that racism uh, is not acceptable uh, on the field. Um, you know, we all know what Nicky Winmar and Michael Long and and those guys in the AFL have done for the sport. Um, 
and NRL maybe is, is even better. You know, they, I showed a, um, uh, a few of the books featuring some, some of the Indigenous stars of rugby league um, only recently, and I think the NRL may be even better at that. But so, yeah. Does that answer your question, Peter? Yes, it does. Thanks very much for that. Paul, uh, interesting segue on Indigenous sport. Uh, our club supports and has supported for some time an Indigenous health scholarship, and we currently uh, are supporting a, a, a young man to be, be a doctor. Uh, and the lady who uh, from our club who coordinates that is Kay Dowling. Kay, did you you had a question for Paul? I think. Yes, I was wondering if he had coached the girls' teams. Have, have I coached the girls' team? I'm just trying to find a girls' team, or if you ever do, you intend to, or not? Uh, yes, interesting question. Of having the three sons, uh, I haven't had uh, that opportunity, but I have, I have taken training a few times. I get asked quite a bit to to take training sessions uh, on the Mornington Peninsula. And uh, I've trained uh, several girls and women's teams just for one-off one -off experiences, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I would like to coach women's football if an opportunity arose. Uh, particularly when I see the, uh, the passion that some of the players have, or most of, of virtually all of the players have. Um, so yeah, I reckon I, that might be something I might do in the future if, if I get the right um, right approach. It might even be at my local club at Seaford. We've um, we've got a good, strong uh, several football teams there. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Tony Milne, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Peter. I was actually waving goodbye to Anna, who's going shopping, but. Um, I, I, I can generate a question if you would like me to. Um, Paul, if you're uh, there somewhere, um, what more ought the Catholic Church to be doing to overcome the problems of the past? This is sort of taking, taking you back to your child abuse um, comments of earlier on. Mm. Uh, are they doing enough? Should they be doing more? Wow, where do I start? Um, no, they're not doing. It. No, they're not doing enough. <laughs> no, nowhere near. Um, but I, I don't expect them. Uh, I, I've, my expectations of, of the Catholic Church to reform is uh, is very low. Um, and I guess I'm not dodging the question, but what I will say, and I've had this approach all along. The, the reform of the Catholic Church is for itself to, um, to work out. I'm not a member of the church. It's not my church. In fact, I've never been a member of a church. So um, the, the way that the Catholic Church has responded and covered up crimes and, and covered up so many crimes um, was uh, jumped out at me right from the start as so unjust, um, unfathomable as well. And then through the, through telling, helping tell people stories like Chrissy Foster, um, these, these issues of guilt and, and power and all of the things that, um, that the church uh, uses in relation to uh, its followers. That's, that's been made clear to me, but, um, you know, that thing about guilt where, where kids enter the church and have to go to confession and, you know, confess your sins, even if you haven't done anything that you think might be a sin and all those sorts of things. They're still quite foreign to me because I don't feel them and I never have been able to, I, I can rationalise it, but I can't feel it. So um, I think probably early on, I, I made a decision that the, the workings of the Catholic Church uh, are not my business. But what I have been very firm on is that they need to, um, they, they, should, they can't get away with what they've done. They can't get away with covering up sex crimes and they can't get away with not um, paying 
in the way that they need to pay survivors. So the Royal Commission handed down so many recommendations. He recommended, for instance, and if I can use a something that you may have read quite often about uh, mandatory reporting, the Royal Commission recommended that, that priests be made that, to come under mandatory reporting legislation. Um, and senior church officials have since come out and said uh, that they would not break the seal of confession to comply with the law as far as mandatory reporting goes. So the, the states and the governments of Australia have done well to move on these recommendations, yet the church here it is saying that it won't break the seal of confession. Um, it's preferring to go by um, its canon law instead of, um, it's, instead of Australia's laws. So that would be an example I would say that the church still doesn't get it. Um, it needs to obey the law of the land. And so for a long time, they got away with covering up crimes and there were others that covered up as well. There are instances where the, where the police uh, covered up these crimes. Um, you know, I could, could go on and on. Um, so the, the church needs to do what the state requires of it. Uh, beyond that, you know, the, the Royal Commission suggested that, it, that the church consider allowing uh, women to, to be in the priesthood, for instance. Um, it's, it made so many more suggestions having looked at all of the evidence. So if I talk about reform of the church, I would just say, well, I agree with virtually everything the, the Royal Commission came down with. Those commissioners listened to so much evidence over five years, not just to the church, I should say, other institutions of, as well, um, some, and some terribly behaved uh, institutions that covered up sex crimes. But um, yeah, the Royal Commission, I think, got it fairly right, but I'm not sure the church is listening to, to that Royal Commission. Yeah, th <coughs> thank you, Paul. Um, it wasn't an easy question. Uh, a quick well, I could, I, yeah, I, and, and I could, when, when I get going on the topic, I could talk forever, but, but I do have to, to remind myself, my, my role as a journalist is to give voice to survivors, is to, re, uh, is to reveal the truth if an injustice has been done and to hold power, people in power to account. And that's my job. Um, and so I've always stayed away from making broad statements about what I think the church needs to do beyond, um, uh, you know, do the right thing by survivors, and and so yeah, I could talk forever about it, but um, that's generally my approach. Yeah, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you. A quick anecdote: um, when I was at prep school in England in the early fifties, the headmaster of my school was a um, uh, an Anglican priest attached to the local cathedral, and. He, he had a considerable habit of um, uh, taking an interest in boys showering and sitting on their beds and dormitories and what have you. He, he, lasted, he lasted two years before the brilliant solution that the church came up with. They sent him to New Zealand. Say that again, I missed the last part. The, the, solu the solution was that they sent him to New Zealand. Mm. Yeah, well... Yeah, there's a, there's a long history of shifting, shifting pedophiles around. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the Anglicans were, were uh, very, in some cases, just as awful as the Catholic Church in Australia. So there's some terrible crimes there. I will say, however, um, and I do need to point out that I think the Royal Commission did make Australia a different place. And I feel like our, our kids are safer. Um, the different governments have have really followed up on a lot of those recommendations. And um, yeah, I, I do think that Australia, Australian children are much safer now than they were before all of this started. Um, and that is, that is in no, uh, I, give, I give very little credit to the institutions. They, they didn't change until the survivors came out and told their stories. Only then, and through the good work of, of some brave lawyers um, and, and families of survivors, those were the people who made the changes and made Australia safer. Those institutions were dragged kicking and screaming to, to change their ways. Um, but ultimately, I see the Royal Commission as a big success. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Paul.
Uh, our next question comes from uh, Elizabeth Davis. Elizabeth. Thanks, Peter. Um, just going back on a topic mentioned before in terms of the Indigenous community in sport, but taking that even to the next level, uh, with some horror that I read in the Australian how Rio Tinto had blown up one of the historic uh, Aboriginal sites in the bush. And uh, I've since read more to hear that even greater um, travesties have happened over many, many years on a regular basis. Um, how much more do you think uh, the media can do to really bring this to the fore because it's such a, I mean, there's legislation obviously that needs to be reviewed and tightened, but mm. I think that we can blow up beautiful works and beautiful historical sites uh, yeah. and confess that we really couldn't even pull it back because everything had been set in place. Just a disgusting behaviour that you yeah. think is unconscionable today, but it still happens. Yeah, I, if I was covering that story, I might have a better response for you. Um, but I was, I was appalled by it, as you were, when I read about it, when I saw, um, saw coverage of it. Um, I don't know that I can add any more or, 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 or give you any more wisdom than, uh, than my re response, which was, which was to think there must be, must be something or some sort of sanction. Um, so I guess what the media can do is, is not let these stories pass by with one day's coverage um, and broadening it out to, to other in, injustices with Indigenous Australians like deaths in custody. Um, we've got to keep pushing and, and not, let's, uh, not let these stories just uh, appear and then slip away without further investigation. Um, yes, and that's... Sir. So much in that area too that you would you would wonder why it doesn't stay in the media longer than it does. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think that's a broader discussion about that as well, and, and resources um, for for journalists to stay on those stories longer. Um, the media is shrinking, I think. In well, certainly as we knew it, is shrinking. There, are, there are um, you know there are online. Um, online sites that are, that are hopefully springing up and, and more journalists are doing things differently. But um, media in this country is under pressure. Matthias Cormann said it, said it this morning when he was asked about ABC cuts and pointed out that uh, the ABC is in a, in a good financial position, um, for paraphrasing, compared to other media outlets. Um, there's, there is so much pressure and it's not good when we see our local newspapers going to because I think about that story and, and um, how much time I put into, um, into the, the clergy sex abuse story and the cover-ups. And I wonder whether I would have got there if I hadn't have been called by that, by that uh, local MP and told to go to the meeting at the local church. I wonder whether I would have got there and, and whether there would have been such intense coverage if that first call doesn't doesn't get made, if that local journalist isn't there to respond, and I think a lot of our journal, the best journalism is, is local. Joe McCarthy at the Newcastle Herald again. What happens if Joe McCarthy is is not there? What happens if there's not a local newsroom? So, I think you're probably right to be worried about the coverage of of things that matter, because um, I, I sometimes think that we let these stories go. They appear and they go away, and um, you know. I wonder whether or we ca whether we're covering it properly, but I think you know, and and fair scrutiny should be applied to the ABC. And I'm not saying that we're above that scrutiny as well, and the way we use our resources. But yeah, that's I think it's a good question, one that we keep should keep asking of our journalists. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Denny, did you have your hand up? Uh, you, Denny, you're muted. Can you just? Thank you. If you hang on, I'll unmute you. Don't touch anything. And no, we can't seem to unmute you, Denny. Sorry. How's that? That's right. Good. Thank there you. Go. Sorry, Paul. Um, I got a little late, so um, I watch the ABC, and I love your segment. As a matter of fact, I love all that. Uh, the breakfast. Um, but Thank you. <laughs> 
I'm still I, looking at that plastic bag, by the way. That's uh, my kid's artwork. You might have already covered this in what you mentioned earlier, but yeah. there's money in the commercial area. Um, have you ever thought about that area uh, in terms of have you been approached or are you prepared to say so? Uh, huh. Because uh, I think you're the best, the most realistic uh, journalist that I see in sport. Uh, so is it like to make any comment on that at all? Yes, only to say thanks. And I'm looking for an agent, so you can uh, you can be my agent if you like. <laughs> but I did I did work in commercial TV for quite a while. I once I left the local newspaper, I wanted to be a um, I wanted to try uh, radio or TV, and I sent out I made little audio tapes in my, my voice, which was terrible at the time. Got some basic training, and I sent out tapes to um, 34 TV and radio stations in Melbourne. Uh, or Victoria, and I only got two answers back, uh, and one of them was from Channel 10. And very soon after that, they had a job on the Sunshine Coast for a, for a reporter. So I worked for Channel 10 up in Queensland on the sunny coast uh, and in Brisbane for two and a half years. I then came back to Channel 10 in Melbourne and worked there for four years. All general news, as I, as I said before, I always liked playing footy on weekends, so I stayed away from sports journalism. Those were the blokes always working on Saturdays. And... Uh, by the way, this caused a lot of uh, a lot of stress for my news directors over the years. I had to, I had to um, reject a, um, a an overseas posting at one stage because I was playing in a local football ground, playing and coaching in a local grand final against Beaconsfield, and my news director didn't understand why I was knocking back a trip to um, to Indonesia to cover a um, a potential terrorist attack. Uh, he, he did say to me. At one stage, you um, you need to choose between your career in television and local football. And uh, I played local footy. I played the game that week. It was a grand final, and I didn't last long at Channel Ten after that. But um, uh, uh, I eventually uh, went to. I, I did go to Channel Nine, as I mentioned earlier. I worked for Channel Nine for a year, and um, then I went to the ABC. I've got nothing against working for commercial television. My time at Channel 10 and 9, I came across just as many hardworking journos and, and camera operators and producers as I have at the ABC. I think the ABC's got so many different uh, outlets to have um, coverage of international events, for instance, uh, and has uh, those different programs like Australian Story, you know, outstanding programs like our Australian Story and Four Corners and the list goes on. Um, so, yes, having given that context, uh, I would never say never, but, um, yeah, I'm happy where I am. I'm very happy working for the ABC. Uh, and also, I did used to get lots of uh, approaches to, to go to um, the commercial stations. Channel 7 um, made me a couple of offers there, but they have dried up since my uh, hair started going grey, so I don't know what to read in, but into that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I haven't had an offer for a long time, so... Um, that could be my problem, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, well, you know, and, and which is silly because, as I say, I'm 44, but I still sort of feel like I've only been in the game a couple of years. 25 years has gone quickly in journalism. Thanks, uh, thanks, Danny, and thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul, uh, a lot of the questions being asked already uh, come from a particular group of people who some in the room would regard as being somewhat as football tragics. Yeah. You'll, you'll notice my uh, my braces today are the colours of Port Adelaide. What, another tragic is David Egan, who has a, a, a question for you about uh, about the history of, of sport and coaching. David yep. Egan. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah. And thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation today. It's been fantastic. I just love to hear the the ordinary story of a bloke that's um, you know, so honest. And uh, uh, I think a lot of us would be in the same boat where we, at that age, we just sort of gave away our uh, interest in uh, everything else just for footy. Um, yeah, Port Adelaide, uh, as, w there's been a story written. This is the copy of the book, a sports book called Destiny which has been written by a, an academic, Dr. Norman Ashford, Ashton, I think his name is. What's it, uh, what's it called? I missed the name. Uh, Dr. Norman 
Destiny. Ashton. Ashton. Is that, no, think, the, the name of the book. Oh. Destiny. 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 Yep. Yep. The story of the elevation of Port Adelaide in, and its um, rather controversial entry into the AFL. And he, he, he writes it as an academic. And uh, yes. I just wonder whether you're familiar with it and whether you have a view on that because of, with our showdown coming up, uh, uh, there's mm. those that uh, like us and those that don't. And uh, very topical. You have yeah, a view a, on Port Adelaide. You're asking a Collingwood supporter? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't understand the. I don't understand the angst between Collingwood and, and Port Adelaide, if there is any. I, I think. Um, I don't know Port Adelaide well as a place, but I know Collingwood came from humble beginnings. Um, you know, in eighteen ninety two, it was formed. It was seen as the poor cousin of Fitzroy because it was down the hill and, and close to the Yarra River, and the, you know, it came from the slums and. There was a book written about Collingwood called Kill for Collingwood, which was uh, in reference to the local butcher who was, uh, I think he might have been raising money for the club and he had to kill for Collingwood. So um, Port Adelaide predates Collingwood, if I'm right, by maybe one or two decades, doesn't it? Does anyone know the formation of the club? Yeah. Was it 1870s? 1870. Yeah. So both, both got great history. Um, Working class, am I right? Yeah. Yep. That's right. So, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, so I don't see the difference. Um, the they've even got the same jump. <laughs> they've even got the same jumper. Um, well, I had, uh, Port Adelaide had black and white before Collingwood did, actually. There you go. Yeah, and <laughs> I know a little bit. I, I read bits, read snippets about Port Adelaide actually in uh, when I researched a book called Fifteen Young Men, and I know the history of football in our area because. There was a, the book was about the Mornington football team that, uh, that sailed to Morty Alec just up Port Phillip Bay and on the way home they drowned. So the, the, almost the entire team drowned in Port Phillip Bay. So I wrote that book, um, 1892, same year as Collingwood was, um, was formed. So I know a bit about their beginnings and I've never been able to understand the, uh, the differences between the two. I've, um, I was there the day they knocked off the mighty Brisbane Lions coming from someone who, who played for fit, a year for Fitzroy, so I had an affinity with, with the Lions. But uh, I was, for some reason, I was going for Port Adelaide that day, and it was, it was bemusing to me that one of the Scott brothers was zoning off Gavin Wanganine. Why would you do that? <laughs> and no surprise that he made him pay. I thought that grand final was, um, was one of the best I've ever seen. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether you thought it might be controversial on the subject, but uh, I quite like Port Adelaide. Um, well, that's you know, how, uh, that's this it. game on the weekend is uh, very important because it's the uh, it's 150th anniversary of the, the footy club. Really, I think I, 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 I mentioned before. I think it's um, I think it's not good that Port Adelaide hasn't got a team in the sandfall. I, I don't know. My, my knowledge of the South Australian footy league is. Um, is fairly limited too, but I followed Norwood for a few years in the 90s because uh, Robert Harvey, the great St Kilda player, is a, a Seaford boy, and his little brother Anthony Harvey um, lifted the cup up in the 90s. I think McIntosh was injured, and Ant was was the first Melbourne-born uh, captain of Norwood who lifted the cup. So I was I was partial to keeping an eye on them, but it seems to me that the the Sandfall at least. Notwithstanding my, my comments, I think they should have somehow arranged Port Adelaide to have a team in the comp this year. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but Sandfall has um, has maintained its identity. Whether you and I'm sure there are nuances there where you think that it's lost a lot. But the VFL in in um, in Victoria has been decimated by the, the changes. I think in in mm. in its culture, still great great football, a lot of AFL reserves. But they're pressing ahead now this year with, with an eight-team competition of standalones. And, and Frankston, my old club, is one of those. But the VFL seems like a, a shadow of the days when it used to be the, you know, the great second tier in Victoria compared to what the Sandville is. So, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd, be more, I'd be happy of being following uh, and looking at that model that you've got over there and be pretty pleased with the Sandville and how it's, how it's maintained. It's at least a, probably the premier... Um, competition outside the AFL now.
Thanks, Paul, and thank you. thank you, David, for the question. Paul, the, the final siren's about to go. Uh, yes. Thank you. You've been a great guest to have, and one which I'm sure everyone's enjoyed, especially with the bird calls in the background. It's one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's custom Rosellas, I think. Oh, well, there yeah. you go. It's customary, up at the top of the tree, yeah. <laughs> it's customary to thank our speakers with a gift. This year we've been making a donation to, uh, to end polio. And uh, a donation has been made in your name. And right. there's, there's the certificate, uh, which Fantastic. will be winging its way to, uh, to Seaford fairly shortly. Uh, but it's really just a, our small gesture to, uh, to thank you so very much for, uh, for giving of your time so generously and, uh, and, and covering a wide range of subjects in a very informative way. Uh, Adri is going to unmute everybody and I'll ask everyone to thank you Paul in the usual way. He hasn't done it. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad no one asked me about uh, a follow-up question on getting how I got expelled from school. That was very nice of you. <laughs> but I've been, but I've been uh, t tinkering away at a um, at another book, so uh, it may or may not feature in that. And uh, you know the, the the trials of 1993 in Frankston. So uh, if you if you'll have me back, I'll talk about that some other time. We, I'm sure we'd be delighted to have you back. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Adri, back to you. Uh, yes, Pete. I did. I, I couldn't unmute all because my unmute all right. button. It's disappeared. I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> These things happen. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for sharing your opinion and view amongst friends today. Thank you and for your time and availability. Fantastic to have you. Thank you. And um, a special thank you to all our Rotarian friends and all our, our other guests for joining us today and for supporting our online uh, format. Uh, we hope to have you all back here uh, uh, next week. Next week, our guest speaker will be interesting given Paul's uh, um, experience described earlier as we welcome Michael Waite, uh, the founder of the Narracore Community News. His topic could be from my finance to local news backing Narracore's new newspaper and basically he will be covering the aspect that in a, in, at a time in which a lot of newspaper, paper newspaper are disappearing, he has, he has created a big success by starting a, a paper newspaper in, in Narracore. I will, now uh, I will now close today's meeting. Thank you very much for being with us. Hope to see you next week. Have a great week. Stay safe and goodbye.